Well, I assume, I assume welcome back. Uh, great to be back together again. Every time I see all that is happening with uh, just Joe talking about the kids and the Clarks and so on and all the way back through with our music and uh, it, there's just so much going on behind the scenes that there's uh, lots to be thankful for, for all that God is doing amongst us, even in this... Even in this dreadful time, we, uh, we do praise God for all of that work. Let me pray now. Help me do that. Heavenly Father, we, we do ask, please, that you would let this time right now be a great blessing to us. Please work through me by your Holy Spirit in a way that um, uh, goes beyond what I can be and do. And uh, we ask that you might speak your words to us and stir us to love and good deeds, stir us to be the people you want us to be, equip us for this time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the between series. Next week, we, no, a couple of weeks' time, we start the series of Hebrews, but we're doing a two-week series right now, today, next Sunday, on spiritual warfare. We're actually going to look at the work of Satan, particularly today. And it's an important thing to engage in. We've been getting a number of questions over months, actually, but uh, also just this last week. Uh, is, is Satan at work, particularly during this time? Is there a heightened activity of satanic work? You know, are the lockdowns, uh, is government restrictions, are they his work? What about the vaccine? Is that the mark of the beast? Is that his work? These questions are coming uh, at us thick and fast. And right there, you know, we're in a church. You know, right there, you know, we're, we're engaged in something that's quite unique in our community. There are uh, no other group I know that would get together and wonder about whether Satan's at work at this time. Because not many places in our community take the work of Satan seriously at all. Our, our world, our community has done a very good job of making uh, him a, a, an object of mockery and, and scorn that he would even exist. Um, and, and just before we dig in there, let me give you three quick things to suggest why I think it does matter that we look into this topic. First one, there is a spiritual, if there's a God, and, and the vast majority of Australians still recognise there to be a divine God over all things, there is a spiritual dimension. The stuff of physicality is not the whole of us. There is a spiritual dimension. And that spiritual realm begs the question if there is a god is there a malevolent powerful evil force person as well in the spiritual realm but but secondly there's a kind of evil that exists in our world that does also beg the question about whether there is some kind of demonic power at work to bring such evil i mean humans are capable of dreadful things but there is a kind of evil that certainly suggests there is another force at work. And, and most other cultures in our world, in history, have recognised that truth, have seen it. But third, I'd say this, Jesus, he, he is very emphatic that there is a real, personal, malevolent power at work in our world. I mean, that reading we just had from the, the clerks there, the Matthew 16, um, get behind me, Satan, Jesus says to his disciples. To, to Peter, he, he's conscious there is a satanic being. Earlier in this chap, in this book, in chapter four, there's a series of temptations that occur by the hand of Satan in Jesus's life. Um, the, Jesus is emphatic. Is the, all the Gospels are unanimous, the four of them, that there's a demonic force, demonic powers that Jesus engaged with. Um, Jesus himself secures this, but there's a spiritual realm, there's God, there's these things I think make clear that there is something going on. He is real, Satan. So, should we be worried about him? Should we be worried that he's at work particularly now? Now, the answer to that is not simple. Because there's not a Bible verse that says... Lockdowns and the vaccine are the work of Satan. And when you see the work of vaccines in the world, that's Satan at work. I mean, the suggestion that it might be the mark of the beast, the vaccine, is itself an assumption brought to that mark of the beast language because it doesn't say that. So how do we know what Satan is doing amongst us? Well, the key to working it out <clears throat> is digging deeper. Being clear on the kind of things Satan does. How does Satan work in our world? 
that the clearer you are on that, the more you'll be able to identify his hand at work around the place. See, what might you expect him to be doing? What might you expect his work to look like? What, what, might you, you kind of, what aroma might you expect to smell if he is active? Well, I want to suggest there's one moment that gives us a window into the deep work of Satan in our world. And it was there in the reading, Matthew chapter 16. It's a massively significant moment in the ministry of Jesus. It's a turning point, actually. You get the same event recorded for us in Mark chapter 8. It's a turning point in Jesus' ministry where up until this point, he's been showing the disciples who he is. He's been bringing um, an extraordinary teaching ministry, a healing ministry, a casting out of demons ministry. Um, uh, he's been doing these extraordinary things. And now he asks them, who do people say I am? He gets a series of responses and then he puts it to them and says, verse 15, who do you say I am? And Peter, bless him, says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're the king. Messiah just means king, the universal king that we've been waiting for to establish the kingdom of God, to bring all the kingdoms of humanity back under God's rule. We've been waiting for you. You're the one. They've now worked out that and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon. This was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Peter's had a special work of God in his life to bring his eyes to see who Jesus is, which is what we long to see happen more and more through our community. And if you've come to that point, it's because of God's work in your life that you now see Jesus for who he is. Then, Peter, then Jesus begins to explain what his ministry will be like. Verse 21. At that time, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Jesus began, begins to explain what his ministry will look like. He'll be betrayed, beaten, flogged, humiliated, shamed, crucified hung on a cross like a criminal and Peter's response to this verse 22 Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him and says never Lord he says this shall never happen to you you're the Messiah you're the great glorious king this doesn't happen to kings and it's not going to happen to our Messiah the Jewish Messiah you're going to conquer everybody and Jesus turns to Peter verse 23 and escalates the conversation massively and he says to Peter get behind me Satan you are a stumbling block to me you do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns wow he doesn't just say Peter you've missed the point he says get behind me Satan now, what is going on here? If we can understand what's going on here, we'll see, I want to suggest to us, the, the work of Satan, how Satan works in our world. Now, what is happening here? Well, let me get rid of two possible readings that are both wrong. Uh, the first is that Jesus is merely overreacting. Do you know, this is how Jesus reacts when people go say things he doesn't want. He just, no, no, he's not. That's not Jesus. The second one that's a mistake is to think that somehow Peter in that moment has turned into Satan. His kind of face changes and Satan rears up within him and Jesus discerns Satan rising up with him. No, 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 no. The roots of it are back in chapter 4. Come all the way back with me. Grab your Bible. Come all the way back to chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He is in the wilderness. There's three temptations that come to Jesus during that time. And the one I want to particularly look at with you is verse 8. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now what you have here is Jesus uh, being offered by Satan the kingdoms of the world. Now there's, there's no hint, uh, the Bible is quite a, very clear that this is something Satan has to offer. 
He is in John 14 and Ephesians chapter 2. He's the king. He's the ruler of, the, of this world, the kingdoms of this world. There is a sense in which uh, he has taken charge and has the kingdoms of the earth, the kingdoms of people to give to Jesus. This is not a critique of that particular part of it. And he offers the kingdoms to Jesus if you would bow down and worship me. Jesus responds, only worship the Lord your God. Bow down and worship only him. Now, this is called a temptation. How is it a temptation? Bow down, so it says, bow down and worship me instead of your father. Now, how is that a temptation and not just a choice? Do, do you know what I mean? I think if I was offered that choice, I'd say, no, I'm not even tempted. Just How is Jesus tempted in that? Well, it's that Jesus could gain the kingdoms of the world by that one act, bowing down to Satan, instead of gaining the kingdoms of the world the way his father would have him do it. See, Jesus came to gain the kingdoms of the world, to bring them back under his father, to bring them back under his rule, to be the Messiah, the king over. That's why he came, to establish himself as the uncontested Lord. But the path the Father had chosen for him to go to establish himself as king over all the kingdoms was the path of suffering, crucifixion, humiliation and shame, sacrifice. It was the path of submission to his Father's will, a path of loss and great cost. And Satan says, here's the temptation, Satan says, I can give it all to you without any of that if you just bow down to me. You can gain what you want without the cost, without having to follow the Father's path. The temptation effectively was a shortcut. It was the way of denying God's way a way that didn't require him to submit to his father's costly will, but a way that would get him there without the pain, do you see? Now there is a temptation in Matthew chapter 4. Fast forward with me back to Matthew 16 again. And you'll see this connection. Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus begins to explain to his disciples, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. He must be killed and on the third day raised. And Peter takes him aside and says, never, Lord. You ought never go the way of suffering. You ought never go the way of humiliation and sacrifice. You're the glorious king. You ought not go that path of rejection. And Jesus says, this is chapter 4 all over again. This is the same temptation. Peter is saying what Satan said back in chapter 4. Don't go your father's way. Don't go the way of the shame of the cross and sacrifice. Don't gain your kingdom by suffering. You're the king. You're our king. Go the way of glory and power and prestige and status. The point is, Jesus sees in Peter that he is channeling Satan. Now, was Peter conscious of doing that? Do you, do you think Peter felt some evil presence well up with him? No, no. Just a moment before, he'd experienced the revelation of God inspiring him to see who Jesus is. The Father has revealed. Peter's not that. He's not some de demonic possessed person. No, no, no. What has happened for him is that he, Peter has absorbed Satan's way of seeing reality he's absorbed satan's way of thinking about life and thinking about greatness actually that that greatness and glory is seen in prestige and power and status not in sacrifice humility and submission submission is not the way you be great asserting yourself's greatness you see and peter's channeling satan's way of thinking you see, grab hold of this. Jesus had lived his life in submission to his father's will. Submission to his father was his joy. And greatness for his father is seen in service 
and sacrifice and humility. That's greatness in God's kingdom, which is completely at odds with Satan's way of seeing greatness because of pride. It was the pride of Satan that causes him to fall, to want to, want to grasp after greatness, do you see? That's Satan's way. And Peter had absorbed Satan's way of seeing the world. Peter was someone who was speaking as a person raised in the world, ruled by Satan. In a world opposed to God and his wife. That's why Jesus says next, get behind me Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but merely human concerns. Now literally it's you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Of humankind is a good translation of it. What are the things of man? Well, the things of man are Satan's way. Because the world has been ruled by Satan and shaped by Satan. Come over with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, the first couple of verses there gives you an insight into the way the Bible thinks about humankind and the world we're in. As for you, verse 1, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed, listen to this, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who was now at work in those who were disobedient. Just notice the connection that the apostle makes. He joins together tightly following the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Satan. To follow the ways of this world is to follow Satan because Satan rules the kingdoms of this world and has shaped them and, and moulded them to think the way he thinks. And so the way of the world is the way of the kingdom of the air. You see these kind of connections. It's massive. Satan is real. He is at work in our world. But he's not at work in the dark, scary movies, only appearing when things smell evil, when things feel dark. No, no, no. He's at work in the world, shaping the world's values, shaping human values, shaping human instincts, shaping culture and what culture cares about, shaping the things of this world, you see, the ways of this world. And verse 3, all of us lived among them at one time, among those who used to follow the ways of this world. All of us lived among those who followed the ways of this world. But notice what he says, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. So what you have is this, um, oh, it's a terrible word, confluence. I don't know, this kind of, um, you have this uh, aligning of Satan, the values of the world, the ways of the world, and our own fleshly desires that all align together. We want what the world wants, and the world is the way it is because we have all wanted it. Under Satan, we agree with what he wants too. And the ways of the flesh, you see, what is it, the cravings of the flesh? The cravings of the flesh tell us, actually, just dig there for a moment, that there are some cravings that are okay. It's the cravings of the flesh that are the problem. You see, there are some cravings that are corrupted and fallen and perverted ways of this world. There are some cravings that are normal and natural. I mean, you crave food when you're hungry. You crave love when you're lonely. You crave to be back together. There's lots of cravings that are good cravings. But there are many cravings that are part of the fallenness of humanity, They're part of following the way of the world, our brokenness. Now, which is which? That's part of the problem. How do you know? How do you know which craving is a craving of the flesh, the way of the world, following Satan, and which craving is a craving just of humankind that's natural, normal and good? How do you know which is which? That's part of the issue. If you follow the ways of the world, are all the values that you hear in the world all wrong? No. We hear in our world the value of compassion 
and kindness and care. We, we do hear about but people have rights. These things are, are values that are acceptable and good. But which values of the world are the wrong ones? Well, the problem is, it's not possible to tell which is which apart from God telling us. Because we're so messed up, our heart, our instincts are deceitful. Jeremiah tells us the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can trust it? Book of Proverbs tells us to lean not on our own understanding but to trust the Lord. We're so messed up, the heart is deceitful. It's not a reliable authority. It can't be trusted to discern between what's normal, natural, good desire and what's one that's following the ways of the world under the prince of the air, the Satan who's... The heart is not reliable. We need a word from God outside of us that we might not lean on our own understanding, our own instincts, but actually heed God and his voice. You see, just notice here how you feel about various things that you're confronted by is not God's voice. How you feel about different things is not infallible. Or to put it positively, how you feel is fallible. There is a work of Satan in our world, a real work. And the real work of Satan is to get us to trust our desires, which are actually fallible. To get us to trust our cravings and follow our cravings as if they're right and good, rather than trust God, heed God, heed his word, go his way that feels so against the grain. Do you know the real enemy for God's person in our world, the real enemy actually for every person in our world, is almost every single Disney movie. Do you know what I mean? I've got some nods going on here. <laughs> you know, I put it starkly like that. I mean, it is an overstatement. Disney movies have got lots of lovely things in them. You know, they've got lots of um, compassion and kindness and so on and uh, care. And it's, it, but they're mixed, and that's the point. The, the, the more alert you are to the radically different values that Jesus brings to the world, values that are different to the values of the world, under Satan, the more alert you are and attuned to the values that Jesus brings, the more you'll see how we are bombarded with an alternate value system in almost every movie, in almost every celebrity, in almost all media. And this is not, this is not a cry to say, don't let your kids watch Disney movies or don't watch, I'm not saying that at all, uh, but be discerning as you watch them. Start to teach, hold the remote in your hand as you watch and pause and drive your kids nuts and say, did you see that? That is insane. How can you think like that? Begin to teach our kids. You see, here's the challenge. Peter didn't have a clue that he was voicing Satan's thought. It was a massive shock to him that he was channeling Satan. He just channeled the father a moment before. He wasn't demon-possessed. It was just that he was so shaped by his culture and the world, which was under the rule of Satan, that, that he couldn't even see that he was channeling Satan. And it ends up that he stands against God's way and partners Satan in tempting Jesus away from the very path that his father had set for him. He had no idea he was doing that. Brothers and sisters, we can still be so shaped by the world and its values that even when we think we're passionately on the right path and saying what needs to be said, we can be wrong. We can be channeling the world's values into the things of God. Just dig here. Every voice that says, 
your natural desires are naturally best is wrong. Every voice that says to give free reign to your natural cravings is wrong. Every voice that says being free as a human is having no restraints, being able to do whatever you want to do, is a value of the world under Satan. Every, every voice that says follow your heart it is shaped by satanic influence. And I don't mean, don't then go, oh, are you saying there's some dark, evil, malevolent? Well, yes, but in a very neutral, in a way that's innocent. I mean, in a way, it, it, the point here is that the very ordinary things that, that are actually not smelling of sulfur actually have sulfur all over them. The voice that says submission is bad. And we, our society has done a hatchet job on the word submission over many decades now that it's oppressive and restrictive. But we are called to be submissive people to the governing authorities, Romans 13. The voice that says life is about our comfort. You are owed your retirement ease and, and leisure. That life is about the seven-day weekend. It's, they're, they're the words of this world shaped by the voice of Satan. The point I'm trying to make is that that which seems harmless is actually the real work of Satan. It's the most terrifying work of Satan. And at its root, if you dig that down further, at its root is the work of deception. The real work of Satan is lies. Do you remember in the garden... Satan says, did God really say? His real work is to bring a lie and a doubt about God's word. His real work is then to bring a doubt about God's goodness in the word that he gives us. He's only saying that because he doesn't want your good. Jesus says in John's gospel, he is the father of lies. That's his natural language, deception. But when Satan brings deception... It's, it's like a hook with bait. You know, you go fishing, you want the fish to be attracted. And so you put the bait on the hook so the fish doesn't see the hook. And that's exactly how Satan works in our world. He shows the bait, the attractiveness of something, and hides the hook. Deception. It's his work of reshaping our thinking, what we value. So that we're then enslaved to our sinful way of thinking. The vaccine. Friends, that is not even in the same ballpark as this deeper work of Satan. It, it's just a health measure. It's another piece of medicine. Like every other vaccine, our human ingenuity is built up it's just a it's just it's not any more the work of satan than panadol is or chemotherapy is it's just a health measure now it might be you still don't like it i'm not giving you health advice <laughs> uh, uh, sure but but make that call on the basis that it's a medical thing not a spiritual thing talk to your doctor get the medical evidence but don't dismiss it as if it's some kind of satanic. It's just not in the same ballpark. One of the great dangers, which is the spiritual danger, is all the talk about spiritual dangers that point us in the wrong direction. So that we're busy looking in that direction when Satan's actually at work in a whole other direction. All the time he's shaping our minds, our hearts, to be filled with the values of the world or filled with foolishness, filled with nonsense while we're looking over here to see if he's... You see, I want to make this big claim that the real work of Satan, the big work that we need to be most concerned about is the way he shapes our thinking, our values, our priorities, the things we care about, that we absorb from the world. And I'd offer this. At whatever point you drop into the letters of the New Testament, you will see this is the actual teaching of the Apostles. And I want to do one of those drops for us. Let's drop into a passage that talks about 
satanic power and work in the world. Come and look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. You see, if, if this is right, what I'm saying, you would expect it to emerge in other places in the New Testament. You expect this to be the shape of things. And let me show you one of them, 1 Timothy chapter 4. And just by the by, the letter of 1 Timothy is written to the city of Ephesus, where Paul ministered for some time, where they were into magic arts. There was a particular influence of the satanic power in Ephesus. But in 1 Timothy 4, Paul goes straight to the topic of this. Look at verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times some will abandon the faith following deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. So we are in a heightened awareness of the demonic realm. You see, this is the chapter that hits a heightened concern about the demonic realm. Now, what do you think he's going to say next? So work out how to ex do exorcism, how to find territorial spirit. You'd expect that would be what he'd say, given contemporary thinking about these things. But look what he does say, verse 2. Such teaching comes through hypocritical lies, whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They've come through liars. Do you see the language of lies? Verse 3, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. Do you see how very ordinary this is? Which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good. He's the truth, he says. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. Do you, do you see, the stuff of physical, that's not the problem. Medicine and so on, it's just part of the physical realm we're in. It's, God makes good things. Verse 6, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. How do you combat the work of d demonic spirits. Verse 6, pointing out the truth. Good teaching. Verse 7, having nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, training yourself to be godly. Huh? Look at verse 8. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. How has he gone from demonic spirits to the truth, to godliness, godliness that's good for eternity. How has he got to there? Because being godly is the battleground. The, the key battleground, the key spiritual war is for our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The key battleground is that we might trust God and obey God. That we might live lives that are different from the world around us. That's the key battleground. And how did he go from the truth, uh, the, the demonic spirits, the truth, godliness, to the world to come? Because the heart of Christ's work is to save us for a new age. The home of righteousness. My kingdom, Jesus says in John 18, is not of this world. 1 Corinthians 7, use the things of this world as though not engrossed in them. For the things of this world are passing away. To set your hearts on the things above, Colossians chapter 3. You see, this isn't home. And one of the works of Satan is to shape a culture that sees that there's nothing more than this world. To shape the values of this world to see that this is home. There is no future. There's no life beyond. There's nothing else. That's one of the great works of Satan. To make us settle here in this time. How do we combat that? With the truth. That this is not home it will go very soon we will all one day stand before the seat of christ the judgment seat of christ we will have eternity with him this is just a moment do not obsess about the things of this world like the world does satan has clouded the blinded the minds of unbelievers so that we might think the only thing that matters is my health 
The big thing that matters is that I take no risks and make sure everyone around me is safe. No. Don't buy that value. We have eternity waiting for us. Don't live like the world. We'll come back as church soon. The vaccination rates are increasing. Uh, it looks like uh, the 90% might be reached by the end of October. And the hints are that 80%, the restrictions won't change greatly. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But it will likely be at 90%. So by the end of October, we anticipate being able to be back together. And I want to encourage you to, to, to not, not think about that like the world would think about it. But to be prepared to gather, even with some risks. We are now in a world where we haven't got zero risk anymore. To not be consumed with the values of this world and think about our life like the world thinks about it. Now the key in the spiritual battle is chapter 4 verse 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. To preaching and to teaching. Don't neglect your gift, which is given through the prophetic, which I take it is a prophetic gift of some kind of leadership that he had. Be diligent in these things. Watch your life and doctrine closely. I'm sorry it seems so ordinary. But how do you combat Satan, the father of lies, who is shaping the values of the world to be opposed to the values of God? How do you combat that? With the truth, with the truth of God's word, with regular, persistent engagement with the scriptures, the public reading of scriptures, preaching and teaching. You know, one of the big points I want to make today is to watch out for misdirection. We've had lots of sport this weekend. It's been a great weekend for sport. Um, and uh, one of the things you see in football codes particularly is, uh, is the dummy pass. Do you know, where you, 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 you look, you're shaped to pass in a certain direction, then pass somewhere else or do something else so that everyone's eye turns to... Or in boxing, it's a feint where you look like you're going to do and do another thing. Satan can make us focus on exactly the wrong thing. The thing that is of least concern and so miss the big thing. The big thing, the way we embrace worldly values... The real battle's there, that we might not live for this world, that we might see that physical exercise, yeah, it's got some value, but don't obsess about it. Because godliness has value for not just this age, but the age to come. Trusting God's word and obeying God's word, living under God's word. Do you see our great danger? It bleeds into everything. Friends, the work of Satan, should we be worried about the work of Satan at this time? Yes, absolutely. He is a roaring lion seeking to devour. We ought to be deeply concerned. We ought not be unaware of his schemes. Absolutely. But the key is to be alert to where he's really working. Be alert to his greatest attack on us. Deception. Error, lies, the values of this world that are so at odds with God and his values. And the answer, prayerfully, is to be close to the word. I know it's so old, but that's the thing. Satan wants us to seem like it's old. He wants us to think, ah, that answer's of no account. Let's give me something else. No, 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 no. How you combat lies and deception is with the truth. How I deal with a heart that's deceitful above all things, I don't lean on my own understanding, I lean on the word of God. I let it reshape my thinking. And can I encourage you to make time to actually not just read, but to learn and to let, it, let the word critique you and correct you. Bring yourself open to it that I might be remade by it. And get in a group if you're not in a group. We've got a wonderful little thing happening at present called pop-up groups. 
Uh, we're starting a new series in the book of Hebrews. If you've not been in a group, not in a group, and you want to get in a group, we can pop you into a group for the next period of season just to get through Hebrews, do it on Zoom, do it in a way that's accessible. Get yourself in a context where people help you be in the Word. Brothers and sisters, this truly matters to us, that we might be no longer following the ways of this world, but we might trust our God and His Word to us and know the truth, because it's the truth that sets us free. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask, please, that you might let that be the case for us, that during this time, this terrible time, you might help us find ways to be in your word, to open ourselves up to your word, to be corrected, to be encouraged, to be stirred, to be led to the truth. Uh, Father, we pray too that you might bring us back together as a people soon, that it might be the case that we can gather again quickly. But we ask in the meantime, that you might help us be alert to the real dangers and that we might be combating those dangers by reading your word, learning your word, inwardly digesting your word. We pray that by that you would keep and guard your people in Jesus' name. Amen.